Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Wayne Callies, and I'm very honored to join the Earth Day Virtual 2022 stage. Um, I'm here today with Jamie Hen, who is the director and co-founder of Fossil Free Media. And he also wrote an extraordinary op-ed that I read recently in The Guardian. So Jamie, thank you so much for taking a second to talk with us. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I wanna dive in because I've got a million questions for you. Your op-ed gave me a lot to think about. Let's start with just the basics. If you can help us connect the Ukraine invasion with fossil fuels, just for those of us who are kind of just getting on board here. Sure. Um, well, it's great to be with you, Sarah, and good to be here for Earth Day. So I think it's really important for people to understand that fossil fuels power Putin's war machine. Uh, the Russian economy is completely dependent on oil and gas, which means that the Putin regime and its ability to wage this horrific war in Ukraine is directly tied to the price of oil and gas and the production of that and our dependence on it. Just to give a few numbers to put that in perspective, you know, 40% of Russia's federal budget comes from oil and gas. And that makes up a full 60% of the country's exports. And so without that money, Putin wouldn't be able to do what he's doing. You know, last October, as Russia was preparing to launch this invasion, they were making more than $500 million a day from fossil fuel fuels. So I think the important thing to recognize is that as long as we're dependent on oil and gas of any kind, not just specifically Russia, but as we can talk about, as long as we're tied in to this global fossil fuel economy, we're going to continue to fund dictators like Putin and other regimes around the world who are going to use that power to wage war, commit atrocities, and continue to worsen our climate crisis. Right. And they'll have us over a barrel. So <laughs> Literally. Speak, exactly. An oil barrel. Yeah. Now, talk to me a little bit about the role of Western oil in this, because I, in my head, I had sort of the Russian oil is here, the Western oil is here. I read in your piece that those are very, very connected. And that was... Uh, I got real mad. So yeah, tell us yeah. A little well, bit you know, that. a lot of us do. I mean, I, I think that's the thing that the oil industry wants to cover up. You know, they're going around right now waving the American flag and saying how proud they are to be, you know, doing oil, U.S. oil and gas and that they're helping fight Putin. What they ignore is that Western oil companies like Exxon, Shell, BP, Chevron, all the gas stations that we all go to, they've been working in Russia for decades, hand in hand with Putin to expand Russian oil and gas production. When the Soviet Union fell apart, it left a really decrepit, old, rusty oil and gas sector that hadn't been modernized and wasn't able to compete on the global stage. And so what Putin and other Russian leaders did was invite in Russian oil, or excuse me, Western oil companies like ExxonMobil to come to Russia and help them not only expand production, but really modernize it, bring it into the 21st century to the point where it could really dominate at the world stage. ExxonMobil did so much work in Russia that uh, its former CEO, Rex Tillerson, who went on to become our Secretary of State under President Trump, he received a uh, friendship medal from Vladimir Putin. I mean, they had a bromance that lasted over a decade. Um, and there's pictures online, people can go look them up. And so I think that's really important for us to understand that while companies here in the US may now be finally pulling out of Russia and acting as if they're trying to help this crisis, it's their work and their lobbying for many years against U.S. sanctions that got us into this mess and trusting them to get us out of it, I think is just foolish, especially when we have so many alternatives and so many uh, solutions like renewable energy to turn to. Now, and before we turn to that for just a second, am I right in my understanding that a lot of these oil companies actually lobbied against the current sanctions in Russia? Yeah, that's exactly they right. affect so, their interests. Right, so this dates back all the way to the first Russian invasion into Ukraine back in Crimea in 2014, yeah. where ExxonMobil and the American Petroleum Institute, which is the kind of attack dog for the oil industry, they lobbied Congress to first try and stop and then weaken the sanctions that were going into place. And when we were ramping up to this next conflict, uh, you know, the American Petroleum Institute was out there again saying that the sanctions should be very targeted and, you know, not really apply to larger parts of the Russian economy. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, we see one thing in the oil industry's talking points and advertisements and stuff they say on Fox News and a completely different story when you just dig one level deeper into the lobbying and work that they're actually doing. Okay, so from what I understand from their perspective, the solution to what's happening right now is more oil and gas, right? We need to increase oil and gas production in the US to offset what's uh, not coming from Russia into Europe. 
My assumption is you think that's a terrific idea. <laughs> it's a great idea. No, you let's got me exactly right. Let's drill all Alaska to hell with Anwar, right? Yeah, that's let's drill Anwar. everywhere, let's drill plan. now. Um, you know, every last acre needs to be fracked. <laughs> exactly. um, bye bye. No, look. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, look, this is the oil industry solution, no matter what the crisis is, right? Like when COVID hit, they were said the exact same thing. Like we got to drill because of the virus, you know, we'll drill our way out of the virus. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what the problem is. They only have one approach. Here's the issue. One, you know, scientists are very clear that we have to stop producing new fossil fuels if we have any chance of tackling the climate crisis. And that was bolded and underlined and highlighted by the latest IPCC scientific report that just came out this month that said, look, not only do we have to stop new production, all the existing oil and gas production we have is enough to push us past the kind of point of no return right. on climate. So that's point one is we have to do this irregardless. Point two is that the industry is acting as if, you know, they're going to flip a switch and prices are going to go down because they produced all of this oil in the U.S., that's just not the way the international oil market works. The price of oil is set by the international market and will always be victim to Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and Russia and all the different things that are happening around the world. There's no way for us to be energy independent if we're still buying oil and gas because it's always going to be a global commodity and we'll always be the victim of these price hikes that happen. Also, these aren't just U.S. companies. We think of ExxonMobil as a U.S. company, but they've said very clearly, we're a multinational and you know our interests are to Exxon, not to the American people. So these are not the folks you want to be trusting with our energy future. And they're so, everywhere, right? I mean, they're not just in Russia, but they're in oh, Africa. They're everywhere. I mean, they're, they're all over the world. Exactly. And I think that that's, that's important for us to understand. So ultimately, more production would take a long time to come online. It wouldn't do anything to reduce prices now. Increasing LNG exports to Europe, as people have said, would take a decade to come online. Hopefully, we still won't be in this situation. And within that time, Europe and the rest of the world could have transitioned to clean, to clean renewable energy. I mean, it's just faster, cheaper, better for the environment, and increasingly accessible for all of us. And so that's what this moment is revealing, is that we're at a fork in the road. We can either keep getting dragged down this path to climate apocalypse by the fossil fuel industry, or we can actually use this as a moment to break free and move to clean renewable energy. So, you know, there are people who are trying to pull us in the wrong direction, but I think it's all of our job to try and push and choose the different path. And do those, do those green solutions, do they exist in the short term, because I think a, a concern that I hear from a lot of people who, you know, maybe aren't super educated about this is, well, it's going to take us 50 years to transition and you've got to build nuclear plants and whatever. I mean, do we have the technology right now to say, starting tomorrow, let's start doing X, Y, and Z, and let's get ourselves on that 10 year path to being largely independent of oil and gas and reliant mostly on green and renewables? The technology is definitely here today. Now, okay. that said, it will take a little while to roll out, right? Like I'm actually trying to get solar panels on my house and I got to find a contractor. You got to put them on the roof. You know, it sure. takes a little while. Right. And like, yeah, I, yeah. I admit that, you know, um, that said, I do own a bicycle, which I, I do recommend. I mean, Congratulations. We have technology we've had for a while. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are solutions here today, but I think we, we do need to be real that people are feeling pain at the pump. And so I think that the right approach is to think, how can we provide people immediate relief to let them kind of get over this gap until we can transition to renewables. And then let's make that transition as fast as possible. And so on the immediate relief side, we've actually been pushing a proposal, which would be what's called a, a big oil windfall tax. And what that means is basically big oil is making record profits off a crisis they helped create. And yeah. so they should pay a percentage of that back to the American people. And we could send everybody a check, just like the American rescue plan during COVID that would provide people relief. So you're not, it's not encouraging people to go buy more gas with it. They can do whatever they want with the check, but it would give families who are struggling with high prices a little bit of a cushion to fall back upon. So that would provide some immediate relief and give us time to then make this transition. That transition can happen way faster than people think though. Um, you know, we have all the tech we need to build electric school buses, to build bike lanes, to provide incentives for people to get electric cars. Um, and then, you know, to put the regulations in place to really force big oil to keep the prices stable while we make this transition. They shouldn't be able to take advantage of that like they are today. Because true or false, we subsidize 
big oil. Right. right? right. I mean, right. No, a paying, lot of the money paying. that we're looking to get back, it's it's our money, right? It's our money. Yeah, it's no, exactly. Money. I mean, I, that's what's so maddening about the situation is that we're paying them at the pump. But at the same time, the U.S. pays um, in direct subsidies $20 billion a year to big oil companies. I mean, $20 billion, that's like the Department of Education's entire budget, I think is like $60 billion. So wow. a third of the money that we put into all the education in America, we just fork wow. over to big oil so that they can go and make even more billions of dollars of profits. I mean, so that they can subsidizing. lobby us against sanctioning Russia. Yeah, so they can use the money to hire another lobbyist to block climate action. Exactly. Well, cool. yeah, thanks, guys. Um, and beyond that 20 billion, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? That's the direct money we give. That doesn't include the amount of money the military is spending, you know, to defend oil and gas overseas. It doesn't right. include the cost in public health that pollution has on our communities, the way right. that we let them use eminent domain to run over farmers and ranchers to build new oil and gas pipelines. So, yeah, I mean, we're giving this industry every handout and political favor we can, and then they still screw us over. And so I think that's the choice that we're facing. And, and thankfully, what I think American people are, are waking up to, you know, I saw recent polling that 89% of Americans want Congress to stop the industry from price gouging at the pump. So I think it's sometimes it sometimes for those of us who who see these issues, it feels like nobody nobody's with us, like not enough people care about climate change. Yeah. Um, this is an issue where I think the public gets it. I mean, they know that these companies are out for themselves and are trying to price gouge and profiteer off this crisis in Ukraine. And so, you know, what we need to do is make sure that our politicians are paying attention and, um, and you know, not letting them off the hook and holding them accountable. Yeah, and I mean, it does feel like the money that we are pouring into these record profits for these oil companies, we could use to green our economy, right? We could put that money to work. It's our money to start with. I want to end briefly um, with a question that I find a little bit controversial because I have some feelings about the idea that it is an individual's responsibility to, with, to, to bring down our carbon footprint and do our part. We obviously have to do that. But the industrial scale of pollution is so much larger than the population. So I don't want to put this all on like, you need to ride your bike to work instead of let's change the bus system and let's change the way fast fashion and things like that. But people watching this, I think are gonna wanna go, okay, any, what's my takeaway? How can I improve this situation? Whether it's through pushing for legislative change or making individual changes. So in the like, I don't know, 60 seconds that, we, <laughs> that we've got, which I know is a big question, but is there something for folks who are watching going, God, I'm overwhelmed and this is terrifying. What can we do to take action here? Right. Well, I'm, I'm like you, where I think that we have to think at a systemic level about the change that needs to be created. And we know that it's an oil industry talking point to say, it's all your fault. You know, exactly. stop focusing on us. It's exactly. you. But I will say, I, I think this is a point where individual action can actually deepen our commitment to the systemic change we want to see. And I think the metaphor to look at is what this country did during a prior war, during World War II, where we did both at once. You know, the government and the public, we challenged ourselves to build victory gardens, to carpool, to recycle, to stop using all these supplies, to make donations to the larger cause. That individual action was part of it. But at the same time, the government also said, listen, Detroit, you're making tanks from now on. And just the way we need right now to say, you're only making EVs and electric vehicles from now on. Yep. Um, and so we need change at all of those levels at once, as long as it's connected. And so what can individuals do? I think we can make the changes in our own lives, you know, do what you can, depending on your economic situation, uh, to move to clean energy, getting a heat pump. Heat pumps are having a moment. If you haven't heard about them, they you sure can look are. them up and they get sure a heat are. pump, you know, make sure that if you are buying a new car, it is electric vehicle, try and use mass tra transit, try and reduce your own consumption. But just as importantly, get politically active, make sure that you're talking to your politicians and telling them you want them to hold big oil accountable. Make sure you're fighting for the clean energy legislation that's still languishing in the Senate and Congress right now. And make sure that you're doing work at a local level. There's so much we can do to trigger okay. systemic change by working from the ground up, whether that's pushing our towns to 100% renewable energy, getting our pension funds to divest from fossil fuels, or just getting on Facebook and trying to convince our 
uncles and aunts that Exxon isn't telling the truth, but that there's, there's another story out there that all of us, you know, I work in the communication space and I think all of us have a role in communicating the truth about what's going on. Mm. There, we're never going to have the advertising budget of Exxon Mobil, but mm. if all of us work together to push the truth out there and, and make that fly on TikTok, Instagram, wherever it is, um, mm. we can fight back because the industry is increasingly a relic of the past and we can create a brighter future if we work together. Right on. Jamie Hen. Um, thank you. We could do this all day. I hope someday our paths cross in person because I've got a million more questions for you. Um, I'm really grateful to you for what you're doing too. I think this fossil free media, the idea of getting PR and ad agencies out of the fossil uh, fuel business is uh, it's a subtle one. It's a nuanced one. And it's one that could do a tremendous amount of good. Um, so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the way you walk in the world. Thank you guys for being with us. Happy Earth Day and uh, do your part and light a fire under the people that work for you, your representatives, um, so that they do their part too. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, y'all.